Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm a midlife crisis PhD student here at Oxford University. And uh, I'm going to give you a, just a very high level view of the research that I've been doing over the last few years. And it, it, um, it really focuses on a different level of conflict, which is kind of global conflict about wildlife trade policy. And what I'm going to discuss today is how that then translates down to pol um, conflict on the ground. Okay, so in the background, the question that I, that I wanted to ask is, how, what is the best way to conserve dangerous megafauna like rhinos, lions, elephants? These are not animals that most people want, typically want in their backyard, yet a lot of African people find them in their backyard, African and Asian people. And um, I, I sort of looked around the world and I saw which parts of the world have been most successful in conserving these megafauna. And, and with some exceptions, the, the, the area that stands out is southern Africa. You find the largest numbers of African elephants, African lions and rhinos in southern Africa. So what are the southern Africans doing that is different? Um, and if we look at the southern African approach, we see that there, sure, there's the, the conventional use of fenced state protected areas, but there's also then been a move outside of protected areas to be more innovative um, and to mitigate human wildlife conflict by creating incentives for people through sustainable use. And the sustainable use approach is quite broad. It encompasses um, photo photographic tourism, which is then sold and to, to, to raise funds as a run as a business. Um, also the sale of hunting experiences, including trophy exports, which gives rise to this activity we call trophy hunting. But really the underlying theme there is more one about devolution of management authority and use rights. That's, that's kind of the underlying principle. The details are not that important. It's the principle of devolution that's important. And this creates incentives that are both direct economic incentives, but also really importantly, which I think is often overlooked, indirect incentives, psychological incentives, both at a social and at an individual level, feelings of autonomy, the feeling of ownership of wildlife, just a sense of ownership. So I'm just going to run you through a quick case study of, of, of rhinos in particular, which is something I've spent a lot of time on over, over the last few decades. Um, and what we see with rhino conservation, the, 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 the most successful countries, again, have practiced things like custodianship on communal and private land. In, in, in South Africa, outright private ownership of rhinos. Managed legal hunting in the two most successful countries, Namibia and South Africa. And then receipt of the economic benefits from trophy trade and then live sales. So there's, there's a whole kind of rhino economy that was created in Southern Africa. And this, this is just a quick graphic that shows how it, how it works. You have a state protected area with rhinos with a lot of tourists viewing them, but then some of those have moved across to privately protected areas and, and communal conservancies where some of them are selectively hunted and there's a sort of lower scale, more exclusive tourism. And then these animals are sold across, so you get this, you get this economic flow. And there are two different models. There's a, there's a completely market-based model in South Africa with sales of, of live animals to private land and money flowing back to, 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 to the state agencies that sell the animals. And it, and it creates all these other income sources. In Namibia, they've got a, a hybrid model for black rhinos where the, the government still controls the way black rhinos are managed, they, but they allow hunting on communal areas and community conservancies. Those funds are then placed into a game products trust fund and then that, those funds are used for rhino conservation and to assist communities and com community development. And if we look at the performance over however many years, from 1973 onwards, the, the top two colors, the, the top one is the rest of Africa, the yellow is Kenya, and then those bottom three colors are Zimbabwe, um, Namibia, and South Africa. And we can see this incredible change. In the countries where rhinos were completely state-owned and state-protected, they almost all disappeared in Africa in the 70s and 80s. And the build-up has been in the countries that have, um, particularly South Africa and Namibia, that have used these um, devolutionary sustainable use approaches. It's quite, quite a striking result. So there's a simple proposition here, which, 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 which I tested in my one study, and that is that decentralization outperforms centralization as a broad principle. Um, 
And um, this, this is very complex, and I won't go into some detail, but this also looks at, at, at what happened in South Africa over time. And we see decentralization initiatives happening around here, increase in rhino numbers, and then here, the, the, the attempted reimposition of centralized controls, stricter regulations, and that led to that led to an increase in poaching, a drop in value of the animals. It's, it's actually been a, a disaster. I, I, there's a lot more detail in here, and I unfortunately don't have time to go into it now. Um, and then I did, a, I did another study um, with, with Tina Hiller. We, we, we did a um, systematic review of the impact of trade restrictions in Southern Africa generally, um, looking at four species. Um, and again, not much compelling evidence that that restrictions alone, um, there's, there's very little evidence that restrictions alone help. There are other factors that are more important. So the question is, is there, a, is there some cross-scalar gov governance mismatch? Um, and, and I now turn my attention to CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, which regulates wildlife trade at a global level. And um, two studies I did here, the one really focuses on the, on the role of ideas in policy making and, and draws on some, um, some of the theory from political economy, but specific discursive institutionalism. And uh, this is just a, a, a schematic of, of how ideas work in the policy space. You have the background of the debate, which then leads into the foreground, which is where policy making takes place, for example, at CITES meetings. And you have two types of influences here. You have cognitive ideas, and normative ideas. But you also have this thing in the middle which we call policy narratives, which are these overarching stories that drive policy. And within all of this, there's a question about how is evidence used to, 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 to derive policy. And uh, as I said, policy is influenced both by scientific fact but, and value judgments, which are the normative ideas. Um, and you see a lot of those value judgments creeping into the arguments and even affecting the science, even affecting the use of evidence. We talk about evidence-based policy, but there's also quite a lot of evidence of policy-based evidence being used. So the evidence is used selectively to, to pursue a particular result. Um, and then underlying all of this, what you can see is that it, CITES uses the precautionary principle, but there are actually two different interpretations of the precautionary principle vying for supremacy in CITES. And the one interpretation is simply that trade in itself, that's the action guiding principle, is risky and therefore must be prevented at all costs. So it actually compels trade to be stopped wherever possible. Whereas the deliberation guiding principle says, wait a minute, when we change policy in any direction, we need to evaluate carefully and think about the risks. So there, there, there's a subtle distinction there, but it's not so subtle. It actually becomes quite important. And then there are these three overarching policy narratives that you can identify by listening to the language of people. A story, which is what, what these narratives are, typically has a plot line and it has specific actors. There's always a moral to the story. And then the actors are either heroes or villains and if you, if you listen to the statements being made, you can identify who they are and then draw out the story. And I identified three underlying stories in the trade policy space. The oldest story is one of global control. And this goes all the way back to the, the Lacey Act of 1900, the London Conference, the, the time when conservation was very much a colonial affair. Um, and the idea was that International governance would be by morally enlightened decision makers informed by scientists. And that was, the, that, was the, that was the main idea that sort of developed right up to the formation of CITES, the US Endangered Species Act. It all, it's all imbued with that kind of thinking. But then there was this pushback, and it came from Southern Africa. And this is the idea of decentralized conservation, which is bottom-up governance by local people who have the greatest knowledge and the best incentives. And it's a sort of a pushback. And so these two narratives are kind of in tension. But then we've had a third narrative emerge since the 70s, since the, since the um, dawn of realization of animal sentience, um, the work of Peter Singer, and so on. And it's what I call the animal protection narrative, which, which, which wants to view animals as, as equal citizens in the world. 
um, and pushes back against commoditization and, and sees co physical commodification of animals um, as immoral and unsustainable. And interestingly, this narrative aligns more or leans more towards the global control narrative because it's actually a, it's, it's a, it's a value-based system. Um, I'll just breeze through this very quickly. CITES, um, I just question whether it has something of a split personality. It has this uh, two appendix listing system. The appendix one system, um, sorry, the appendix two system is supports and enables, supposedly enables sustainable use, but the appendix one does not at all. It's a completely prohibitionist approach and obviously has appealed to those supporting the animal protection narrative. And my other uh, part of my research looks at how CITES can then be gamed by special interest groups. Um, who use the, the way the system works, but particularly the, 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 the precautionary principle and the voting structure. And I argue that the convention structure actually entrenches conflict because of this voting to get something on or off um, Appendix 1 um, is, is a kind of a winner-takes-all approach. So it becomes a real kind of them and us environment where, 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 where they're those trying to vote the animal onto Appendix 1 and those that are trying to keep it off. And, and, and that system completely struggles to com cope with complexity, and it excludes local voices. Um, very last quick take, the UK trophy import ban is similarly being gamed, I, I would argue, in that way. It's a one-size-fits-all policy. It's definitely not going to do anything useful for rhino conservation. It might help some species in certain countries, but as a, as a blanket policy, it's probably going to do more harm than good. Um, and I go into the uh, reasons why. And then just to close with solutions, um, we're, we're, we're working on a paper on this as well, but it would really be to broaden society's listing criteria to include all relevant social, economic, and governance factors and move away from this emergent system of polarizing appendices and winner-takes-all voting because we're really going to base-level tribal politics with, with the way the convention is structured and what it's conspiring to do. So I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, and, and of course, similar principles apply to stricter domestic measures like the UK ban. So there are some references, but um, a lot of this work is still in process, and there will be a few articles coming out hopefully later this year. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great talk. Uh, I'm actually from Botswana. And having you speak about CITES actually and decentralization had a thought pop up into my head, especially since our government was threatening to leave CITES. Do you see a potential for the future wherein uh, Southern African countries completely decentralize themselves by removing them from CITES and sort of leading to a siloing of different sort of policies all around the world and whether that may actually be for the better, as our government says, or it's up in the air? Uh, I'm afraid the short answer is it is up in the air. It's very interesting. I mean, there's, there's a lot of dis dissatisfaction in Southern Africa. Um, but, there's, but unfortunately, the world order is quite a powerful thing. And so there are a lot of cent incentives to stay in societies, despite all the costs, despite all the disadvantages. So it's very hard to see, to, to tell how that will play out, because unfortunately conservation is quite low down on the rungs of... of, of and it, it, these matters get traded off politically against other policy issues. And it's really hard to tell what's important and what isn't in the greater scheme of things. But clearly for countries like Botswana and Zimbabwe, the, the economic damage caused to them by CITES is huge. Um, or by, by Appendix 1 listings and trade restrictions. Uh, just, uh, just one short question. Um, when there's a ban on products that is relatively simple to, to supervise, to control, so when one allows for trade, one runs into the problem that there needs to be some kind of uh, monitoring control, certification of the products traded. Uh, I think that is a big policy issue, how to implement the the institutional setting uh, to govern uh, a fair trade in this field. You're, you're absolutely right, but I'd like you just, just to think about something 
so there was a there was a complete ban on the trade in vicuña wool. The Latin American countries then got together. They established institutions. They they kept the ban in place for a little while, and then they opened up trade and they and they stabilized things. Bans can be very effective short-term measures. If they become long-term prohibitions, then what happens if, if the market demand persists for the products in question, then organized crime will move into full that void. And then you start getting path dependence in a really undesirable direction, particularly with a, with a product like Rhino Horn. We've been trying to ban it for several decades. Now, it hasn't worked. It's been a disaster. It's like the war on drugs. It just hasn't worked. And we've seen this proliferation of organized crime and, and horrible, nasty spillover effects, systemic, in, in southern Africa. It will take an, a gargantuan effort to overturn that and to create the kind of system you need to, that, that you, you've spoken about. But I do believe that system ultimately would be better. A, a, a controlled, um, but you have to put those institutions in place and, and the cost is a lot higher now when you're operating in this organized criminal environment. And my only plea is let's not do more of this. Let's not create more crime and continue probe. The, the, the general direction in wildlife trade is towards prohibition. And I think it's a disaster. I think it's the new war on drugs. And I think it's going to end up just as catastrophically. Thank you very much. You're welcome.